Welcome back, everybody. My name is Geraldine de Bastian, and I have the honor of being your stage host here today and tomorrow at the Fashion Sustain Conference here at Neonit. And I'm excited about this next topic because we've been discussing this morning, and especially linking up to the last panel, how do we get sustainability topics out of their niche and make them mainstream? And that's exactly what we're going to be addressing with this topic, where we're going to be looking at football merchandising, and specifically St. Pauli's merchandising, and seeing how can we get sustainable merch out there, how can we make it attractive to the clubs, to the buyers, and of course to the customers, and really help make these topics popular and mainstream. And there are four people here with me today to discuss this topic. Florian Neumann from FC St. Pauli merchandising team. Lina Pfeiffer from GOTS Certification Agency, Dorothee Zaraspeha, who's a sustainability consultant, and Jan van Hoeve from Klabu, who produce um, tree codes from recycled materials. So I'm very happy to be joining the stage together with them shortly. The format for the session is so that both Florian and Jan are going to give you short inputs, and after that, we're all going to join on stage and a debate. So first up, I'd like to welcome Florian Neumann on stage. Please give him a big round of applause. Yeah, thank you. So football is the most popular sport in the world, which brings people from all social groups together. Everybody can play football um, without having big um, financial other challenges. During World Cups, millions of people are supporting their countries, and even politicians um, claim to be fans of their national teams. So why do fans um, buy their jerseys or merchandising? It's because they want to show up their solidarity, their support, or, and their identification with their clubs. And all in all, football became a global business with a great impact, uh, but the main product, uh, product sold are emotions. So who are we, FC St. Pauli? We have our roots in the famous red light district in Hamburg, Germany. And we aim to be different from other football clubs because of our um, political and social values, being anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic, and supporting refugees. Last year, for example, we sold a shower gel with a controversial name, and uh, it was a big success. But um, and at the end, um, the profit supported a project against racism. Of course, we benefit from our cool Jolly Roger logo I'm wearing right now. Um, which is part of our brand and helps us to be more than only a football club. And uh, football has such a big platform we want to use for other matters which are more important than football and we want our fans to participate to social and political issues. And also as a democratic-based organization on our own topics. We're controlled by 20,000 members <coughs> and um, all important decisions are taken at our annual member assembly, which is the most powerful instrument in our organization, and uh, where each member can bring on a topic to an election. In 2016, the member passed a proposal of an 18-year-old member to change the whole merchandising assortment to a more sustainable um, production in an ecological and social way. Following this proposal, our sustainability project at FC St. Pauli Merchandising started with a team of volunteers consisting employees and club members with personal experiences on this topic. What have you done? We started to build up knowledge. We had talks with Greenpeace, with the Clean Clothes Campaign and other companies facing this challenge. Um, we analyzed our current situation and uh, face the first problems. We have an assortment with over 500 different items consisting toys, textiles, accessories, mugs. How can you do or produce these old products more sustainable? Um, also, we have a lot of remaining long-term stocks on some items. Um, changing the production is not so easy quickly in this case. And regarding our jerseys, we have contracts, uh, marketing contracts with our outfitter and partner um, Under Armour, who's directly responsible for the production of our jerseys. And regarding our whole assortment, our t-shirts and hoodies made of cotton are even more important than our jerseys, and that's why we wanted to start with this merchandising assortment. So we took the first decisions. 
we change the whole assortment and we won't launch only one unsuccessful uh, low collection. We start with cotton articles where we replace conventional with God certified productions um, because of the strong requirements of the label and also because it's, already, um, it's still easy to realize for us. And for other um, products made of synthetic fibers, we realized that we can replace them by recycled fibers. For example, our rainbow beanie was made before of polyacrylics and now it's made of recycling polyester, so old water bottles. But what are the targets for us? We want to motivate other clubs to take over these ideas, to change their values about productions. For being honest, the average football fan, drinking football, uh, beer uh, football fan, doesn't care about productions. He only sees the logo and wants to ident identify Kite with, um, with his club. And we want to teach them that um, sustainable productions are also important in football merchandising as in other industries. So how can we do it? We want to avoid a choice between conventional and sustainable productions. It's easy. Either you buy a sustainable product or nothing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian. I think this is really inspirational. I'm looking forward to discussing that journey that you just described, which started with an 18-year-old fan. Like, how beautiful is that? Um, so next up, I'd like to welcome Jan to stage to add his part of this story. Thank you. Um, yes, hi. My name is Jan. Um, I'm from Amsterdam, not a German guy. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Can you hear me? Um, I'm the founder of Klabu, uh, and we launched only two months ago. Um, to get something straight, our fashion is not sustainable. Um, there's a reason for it. Our impact is on uh, the social aspect. So I'm going to show you um, what we're working on, and I'm really glad and it's inspirational to hear from Sao Pauli that they're also working with refugees. We are focused solely on refugees. The big problem today is that there are 71 million forcibly displaced people, um, many refugees, and the number that always strikes me is that, there are sev that refugees stay on average 17 years in a refugee camp. 17 years. And I don't know, has ever, uh, has any one of you ever been to a refugee camp? Uh, no, and I don't blame you. The refugee camps that we are working in are situated far, far away from all the microphones and the cameras in the world. Actually, the first one we're working in is at the border of South Sudan. Um, there, there are 36,000 refugees, among which 80% is aged under 18. Uh, so, so many young people and there's nothing to do. And that's the situation in refugee camps. And what we have done is we have built a sports club, a first one. And our aim is to set up many more sports clubs in refugee camps. So there's one going on and we built them their merchandising, which we're selling to raise funds for next sports clubs. But instead of telling you uh, my story, I want to show you their story. Nimechoka maisha yale Mama nasema please Niruzi nyumbani Oh mama please The types of stories that I feel like I need to tell to the world is the story of resilience We are here, we have stories We are living the life that people are waiting to see We are people with dreams We are people with goals We are people who wants something to achieve in life. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. When you came here, we are the same. Every culture, we accept. We are trying our best to make it a, a hope. Through sports, we can tell people that I'm somebody like you. I want to be like Messi, I want to be like Cristiano Ronaldo. The 
when you come in sports, I can play with the Somalis, the Sudanese, the Burundians, the Rwandans, the Ethiopians, because we are together. The most amazing thing for club is that it's it's open for everyone, especially the youth and doing something that they love. And the community have so much hope in the club that it will change lives. So, this is the story of Klabu. I'm really proud because this took me two and a half years. I was a corporate lawyer before. Uh, I had no idea about fashion. I did have an idea about refugees. I was an intern at UNHCR and I knew what the situation is in refugee camps and that sports empowers so much. But we needed to find a way to build a business model because we can't rely on donations only. So. Um, what we've done is, I'm going to skip this. Uh, this, these are the refugees we work with, um, you've seen them in the film. What we've done, we wanted to combine impact with raising funds, building awareness, but also creating commercial success. Both go hand in hand. So we developed Klabu Sportswear and we started by just two simple kits, a home and away kit representing our tagline, uh, home, away is home. Um, they are available through our web shop, um, through the amazing support of the big companies and also some PAR agencies like BAM in Berlin. Uh, we were able to reach cool people who could support us and who could spread this Klabu word. We're still, we're, we're down the road only two months and we just opened even our shop. Um, what, what our goal is, is not only to sell these jerseys, but to build a brand. And it should be a brand of sportswear that enables others to play. So each one purchase uh, creates one club membership for a refugee, whether it's in Calobe, that was the first camp, or I at other places. But to do that, we need to think big. We are so small now, our team only consists of three people. Um, so we need to build these connections and that's why it's a great opportunity to be here and to see if we can collaborate with other brands, um, with other supporters. So this was what I was saying. Um, this is me. Um, you can follow us on Instagram, uh, the Klabu, um, hashtag uh, buy the shirt, uh, support us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. You can stay with me on stage, actually. And I'd like to welcome Florian back up. And please, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause also to Dorothee from DS Agency and Lena from the Global Organic Textile Standard. So before we dig into conversation, I want to also give the word to the two of you to introduce um, what you do a little bit and, um, yes, and join in. Yeah, hi. Are you still awake? No? <laughs> All with the phones? That's great. Um, hi, my name's Lena. Uh, I'm replacing a colleague last minute, so please bear with me. Um, I've been working for God uh, since three years, and we're, um, I was responsible for the German-speaking area. And I'll try to make uh, my input sort of um, at the beginning very short, so we can all have a fruitful discussion. So the Global Organic Textile Standard is a processing standard for organic textiles. And basically, um, it has four ingredients that are important. One is that it is uh, reliant on um, organic natural fibers, that um, it requires independent certification, which you will hear about um, in a minute. Um, that we cover environmental and social standards. Uh, social standards, those are the um, international labor organization's key norms. And um, yeah, uh, that's, um, I would leave it at that for a moment. And then we can um, see what else comes up in the discussion, right? Thank you, Lena. 
Okay, hi there, I'm Dorothy. I run an agency called DS Agency, which um, focuses on sustainability and diversity. Uh, in this framework, I work as a freelance textile auditor for Control Union, and I certify GOTS as um, amongst other programs, and that's how I got the connection here, because I work together with Florian on getting um, FC St. Pauli GUTS certified. So that's basically what I do. Also, I do a lot of like compliance training and basically getting brands ready to work with transparent supply chains and getting on a stage where they can confidently go into the process of being certified. Thank you so much. So I want to cover a couple of topics, but I also definitely want to open it up for your questions and comments. And we have a microphone that is also a throwable object. So um, since this is the sports panel, I hope that's going to go particularly well during this session. Um, so, um, I, I said in my opening statement that we, I want to talk about a little bit how to get these topics out of their niche. And I found it quite, so I'm going to start on this end of the panel and move around. I found it quite surprising in the last session that we just had, um, a lady representing Rimai Organic Trade Cotton was on the panel and said that she actually needs to sell a whole bunch of her cotton as normal cotton because there's still a missing demand. I found that very surprising and also kind of sad to hear. Um, how important is it to have initiatives such as this one, big players, big commercial entities come on board? Mm. And how do you try to do that in your work? Right, so maybe I can start from the point of view of um, GOTS. It started in 2006 with um, 27 companies. And right from the beginning, um, a thing that I did not mention, we're a non-profit organization and we're the standard um, versus the certification body um, that actually does the, does the inspection. And right at the beginning, we try to focus really um, on yeah, basically telling people what GOTS is um, and going also uh, to bigger retailers, um, do seminars, um, trainings, etc., etc. because GOTS is a processing standard that covers the entire textile supply chain. And we did see that um, in the beginning, the bigger success sort of for, for GOTS, at least in terms of the numbers of certified facilities, um, where when bigger retailers started to demand got certified textiles, which then in the end made, um, yeah, had a um, pulling effect of, on the entire supply chain. So nowadays there are 5,700 5, um, certified entities and this is also due to demand. Of course you um, need bigger and stronger supporters. Um, also what I learned um, a bit during this presentation, I'm always inspired a little by um, the communication methods of smaller initiatives, maybe. Uh, that's um, one thing that, as a standard, you can always learn from. Uh, so that's good. Um, I think, uh, on, on, on the comment of, of demand, I think it's quite tricky because you end up, whomever you talk to in the industry, you end up um, hearing a lot of different insights. So some will tell you there is demand and we're covering it, and then um, there's opposite views. So. Um, an organization that ex actually covers the availability of uh, organic cotton is um, Textile Exchange. They um, have an annual report on the availability, but certainly we need sort of the pressure from, well, consumers and actually buyers uh, to, yeah, to take that up. We seem to be in this sort of in-between phase. So I'm not from the fashion industry, so I had to do some homework to prepare for today. And I read a whole bunch of these like top trends, in the fashion blah, 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 blog posts. And one of them mentioned you because one of the trends was sustainability and, and consumer awareness. And it said there are more and more young companies and designers sort of waking up to this. And it mentioned a company called Pact that offers organic cotton um, garments that are certified. By, um, by GOTS. And, and it seemed to me quite interesting that on the one hand, it's, it's now cool. Like we're not in a niche yet anymore. And you can now market things as being sustainable and as being made from recycled materials or being certified. And it's cool. And on the other hand, we still have the phenomenon that the lady on the last panel described. Is that true that we're in this in-between in phase? I think that's absolutely true. There's, a, a, like, there's an expression for that and that's still called the um, value action gap. 
So this is like all these consumers in this particular bottle, like bu bubble, sorry. We think, of, like everyone thinks, oh yeah, we are so sustainable and I make the right kind of purchasing decisions. And in the end, you choose something that is cheaper or more accessible or fast fashion, you know. So what you asked before, those initiatives to put it on the radar, what it really means to make good buying decisions. I think that's absolutely important, together with education. It's all coming down to education. People need to understand what their decisions kind of have an impact on the whole world, basically. This is also, by the way, one of the things when you introduced your brand and you said, hey, we are not sustainable, we focus on the social stuff. In my opinion, you can't be sustainable if you don't focus on the social part. And that goes with your buying decisions and you vote with your dollar, as the Americans say. And sorry, to add to that maybe, um, that's the point I meant about communication, um, because it is true. I mean, those of us who work in the textile um, industry for many years are a little tired of this discussion. It's, it's always the same, like, yeah, we're a niche, it's important. How do we scale it up? That's sort of the, the ground basis on, 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 on all panels. Um, but I think that's where communication comes in. So um, I would argue it is true that um, we do have a communication problem in the sustainable textile industry. And as long as we don't, we don't push a little harder with that, uh, because marketing budgets are maybe not that great, et cetera, et cetera. And also sustainability as a term is rather huge. So I think th those are extremely important points. We'll get back to the communication topic in just a minute. But um, I, I love the point you just made, Dorothy, because I think very often we forget that in the sustainability triangle, there are all these, there's not just one and not just two sides, but there's three sides to it. And it's also picking up on the last panel where we said your organic menstrual products cannot be fair and social if the farmer down the end of the line didn't get paid fairly mm -hmm. for them. Agreed. And it's a topic that's so prevalent in all the um, climate protection debates and also currently in Germany when we talk about introducing a carbon tax is how do you make it socially acceptable because otherwise it's not going to work for people, especially poor people. Of course. So perhaps there's some pitch advice. <laughs> You're sustainable no. on two of three triangle sides. <laughs> what no, about no, no. I, I totally agree. I didn't express myself correctly. It's not that we don't want to be sustainable. <laughs> not at all, of course. It's just that at this phase, very early phase, we needed to make decisions. Um, our impact is now on changing the lives of refugees. And of course, the next step is that we produce these sustainable as well. But these are uh, produced in Italy. We got prices back from the factory. And I'm just a simple lawyer. Um, I was looking at those prices and there was the sustainable price and the non-sustainable price. If we would go for the sustainable price, then we could do a lot less in the refugee camps. Yeah. So we chose at this very early stage with the limited budget we have to go non-sustainable. But I do care and that will be the next step. Is that the biggest challenge? Is it, is it financial in producing sustainable merch? It's financial and finding the right uh, resources, the right factories, the right people, you know, what can they do? Um, and I... I'm being advised by other people who do the clothing part mm -hmm. and they are also questioning, for example, recycled polyester. Mm -hmm. What I'm understanding is that recycled polyester leads to, you know, when you wash it in the machine, uh, parts come off and they come into the, uh, the micro elements. Listen, um, next step is we'll go professional on this. But right now our impact is in the camps. Just because I get to do um, several panels here on stage, I wasn't going to interrupt. I was just going to pinpoint you to some possible collaboration partners. Yeah. Because on the first panel that we had here today about clean water, there's a gentleman who invented a washing bag that will prevent all your microfibers from going out into the washing. Because um, we had another gentleman on the panel producing recycled material clothing from plastic coming from the ocean. So I feel like we should all be exchanging our notes and contacts after this, because yeah. perhaps in future, um, we'll sell bags packaged uh, with your tricots. And, and there are many other ways to make it sustainable. For example, we're talking to big brands to use their leftovers. 
Huh? So not adding more waste. So it's not only about purchasing new materials. We're looking at a lot of ways, um, but you also have to make choices. Florian, I'd like to talk a little bit about San Pauli now. Um, I'd like, can I have a raise of hands for the audience of non-German people in the audience? Okay, so there are quite a few. So I don't know about for you who are not from this country, who are so familiar with our football team uh, landscape, but San Pauli is not like other football teams. Why, what makes you different? Yeah, as I said, um, we are focusing not only on the sports, um, but also to social and political issues. Um, and we want to use our big platform for it. So if there are problems in our society, um, we get more and more right-wing parties uh, with more power. We want to be against them, to fight against them, and not only focusing on football. Yeah. And we have a heterogeneous um, fan base um, where you find lawyers, bankers, but also punks on s and students. So it's not only um, one group um, which is participate, uh, pa participating in our club, but also the whole society. I think that's really special and it's really great that you point that out, that you have this heterogeneous crosscut of society who's into your club and sort of also it's also a branding thing, getting football out of its sometimes a little bit populist seeming niche. Um, so is that the main reason why you allowed for so much sort of participation from fans? I mean, I know football is generally all about the fans, but do you think other clubs would be so open to accept fan ideas the way that you do? I don't think so, because um, the communist commercialization is um, taking over the football, but uh, we want to stay at our base. We have uh, fans which were always participating. The Jolly Roger, for example, was brought to, um, by our fans to, to, to the club. It was designed by other people, but um, mainly it was our fans. And um, as I said, we are, have a democratic base. All important decisions are made by our members. And um, that's why we want our fans to participate also. So was there an immediate openness? Like I can imagine, you know, we, this is the time of Friday for Futures and young people going to the streets and like voicing their political opinions, which is beautiful. And did you feel that this 18 year old fan was kind of in those lines when he voiced this idea and was everybody like, great, let's do it? Or what kind of hurdles did you face? I could imagine that she <laughs> is going to the Friday for Future the, um, demonstrations. Um, yeah, firstly, um, it was nothing so special because uh, we thought one day um, something like this will come to us uh, and we have to face it. So we did some preparations. Then we started the project and um, built up some knowledge. Um, I think it's really cool to have so much different persons. We are not only um, um, people from big companies who want to sell something to our club. Um, these are members who are participating. So getting in touch with them, getting a new view, not only um, um, an economical uh, view on, on these topics. That's really cool and satisfying, I think. And one more question for you, um, but we, you sort of explained in your opening remarks how you were doing this sort of step-by-step -step in turning your merchandise range into sustainable products. Like yeah. mm. We just talked a little bit about the financial challenges, but also a little bit about supply challenges. What are the biggest issues that you're facing? Um, right now, y you have to imagine we are a company that runs a business and now we have to change our business. Um, there are, we face a lot of problems, um, price politics. When do you want to grow the price or um, should the prices stay? We have remaining stocks on some items. Um, there were long-term partnerships with suppliers. Um, the, the whole organization has to change a bit his, his views on these productions. I think um, there are more organizational things um, that were the challenges than the um, purchasing uh, challenges. So I want to talk a little bit about synergies and see how this can sort of cross-pollinate each other and maybe sort of moving back this way around. Um, the work that you do is amazing, of course, and very laudable. Um, I think a lot of us can imagine, especially if in many of the regions that you mentioned in your presentation, what it means mm -hmm. for a young person to have any kind of perspective um, to engage in something that they like doing and maybe even own a trico. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, 
there are, I can imagine, a number of large football organizations or other sports organizations interested in supporting this kind of endeavor. Did you, is, is that something you're looking into, those kind of partnerships? Or is it something where you say, no, we want to stay like kind of independent and team independent? Uh, look, my aim is to change the lives of those million of refugees, young refugees being stuck in camps, having no future. Um, so I'm up to anything that works. Um, of course, we have our integrity. Again, I was a lawyer, so I know what we need to do and what we don't. But if opportunities come up to work with Sao Paulo, with Gods, uh, you know, of course, yes. And we need that. Again, we're so small. And if we want to have that impact, I believe that, you know, I work at Impact Hub in Amsterdam. That's a hub for social enterprises. All those enterpri social enterprises are super small and they want to change the world. But you can only change the world by making money, by collaborating with the big players. So I'm trying to find that common ground and seeing how we can help each other. That's why I'm here. And I have another collaboration question for you, which is that I know of some NGOs out there that do similar things, but in other sporty areas. Like, for instance, there's an NGO, I actually don't know if they're still so active, but called Skatistan, mm -hmm. that like, yeah, skating in Afghanistan uh, was the thing that they started out with. Do you team up with other NGOs trying to do similar things? Is there like a network of good-minded sports NGOs out there? Oh, there's a big network of NGOs. Um, there's not a lack of NGOs. The, the thing is that a lot of NGOs are struggling, you know, to even get their funding. So I see big opportunities working with the companies, working with even corporates. You know, people are looking at corporates and thinking, hey, uh, why should we work with them? But the fact is that they are making money and we can help each other. We can inspire them, you know, to do something good with what they're earning. So I think, yes, working with NGOs, okay, but working with the bigger players, that is what all the NGOs should do. So I, did you want to say something directly to that? Um, yeah, actually, I've been having some, some thoughts. So maybe <laughs> coming from like uh, problems to solutions, um, one way, um, actually, we discussed, like I, I asked him privately, so how long did actually the knowledge accumulation last for you? Because I think that's one of the central things that, first of all, um, yeah, fashion companies or organizations have to be aware of, and it was like a, around a year, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And one thing that we always do is we try to target umbrella organizations. So um, I'm not a, I'm not a football enthusiast. Sorry, <laughs> I'm. Uh, I really love festivals. So what I try to do um, wherever I go in. Um, at music festivals, I try to like find the responsible person who I can talk to, um, or at least the, the contact for an umbrella organization. So I think that's always um, looking a way up can bring you actually, um, yeah, can bring you really far. One fair that I've been to, which um, showed me how lagging behind the merch industry was, is um, uh, sorry to say that, but that's the truth. Um, TV. Um, TV textiles in um, Stuttgart last year and I really seen that again coming to communication that we um, as a sustainability community need to be raising way more awareness because with the fashion industry I see in the last five years anyway um, stuff has changed majorly uh, I would say but um, with the merchandising industry that's not the case at all I would say. But if I can say something yeah. about that, because um, from my experience as an auditor, like actually auditing, certifying merchandising companies is one of the most tricky things. Uh -huh. Because you have the basic, you have, um, you have, if it's something that's like sports directed, you have the question of like smart materials, they need certain properties, whatever football players need. I have no idea to <laughs> be honest, but I'm sure they need like some special thing in their shirts. Like football. And <laughs> And if it's like if it's plain shirts, when you think about like band shirts, music, birch, all this kind of merchandising, you always have to differentiate.
difference between like the plain shirt and whatever happens once it has like the print of your favorite bin brands Absolutely. or uh, embroideries over whatever you know festival or mm -hmm. something so that is where the tricky part lies with the merchandising yeah though i would argue that um most at least in music festivals most shirts are made from cotton so that's again a different different thing um but also, uh, because you you mentioned um, uh, that it was difficult for you to gain knowledge, sort of. Um, in terms of suppliers, this is where I see um, an organization such as GOTS and an, as an enabler, because we do publish um, all certified um, suppliers. We publish them on our website. You can access them, and that goes, I think, uh, for, for most of the standards nowadays. Not all, but most of them. Um, so... How how is it with you? I mean, I know you took some time. How is it with you? So the people know how long they should prepare for or what they need to consider. Those are different points anyway, but. Well, it took me one year and a half to get the whole Klabu concept about building sports club. I didn't talk about that uh, here, but to get the concept right so that we can copy it easily to many refugee camps, tend to favelas, to slums. Okay, so that was a year and a half. And then it took me a year to get this right, right. so that it looks appealing um, and that we could find a source that would even, you know, welcome our small, small quantities. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really happy that we could launch this two months ago after two and a half years of preparations. Mm -hmm. There is so much room for improvement and I see that. Right. So we're going to work that towards that. And I knew about your website. I've looked at it actually. Um, but I must be honest, we went for the easier way that was the connection through our designer. Um, they welcomed us. They could give us an affordable price made in Italy. And now we're building. So um, I just had a sneaky look at the clock and before we run out of time, as I said, I do want to open for your questions and comments. If you could raise your hand visibly, that would make uh, life up here easy. None yet. Okay, well, you can keep them coming from now on if you like. We're very happy to involve you in the chat up here. Um, how do we scale this? I can imagine that this is like your huge stepping stone um, because now there's a precedent. You know, you can say, but there's a football club in Germany producing sustainable merch. Mm. How does that help on the journey of trying to get close the value action gap? <laughs> well, I think again, visibility helps and putting it on the radar of people, you know? You need organizations that are like not naturally organic or sustainable and don't naturally have that in their like brand DNA because therefore you reach the target groups and the crowds that you want to reach. You don't, like, we preach so much to the choir. Everyone in this room knows about sustainability. We have to go outside. So find these collaborators that don't have it on their radar at all, make them aware, make them and if it's just one product, they should put out one sustainable product because then their consumers will understand it, will see it, and maybe get curious. Do you hope there's going to be copycats? Do you see other German football associations sort of going like, mm, they're doing sustainable stuff now and everybody is sort of into the Green Party things and young people are protesting, maybe we should do the same? <laughs> so we hope that uh, we motivate other clubs for it. I already had one talk with another um, club of the Bundesliga, which is one uh, league uh, above us. And uh, I explained it how we want to do it. And uh, I think that most of them um, doesn't know that it, it's not so helpful to, to only get one item or one collection. You have to do it all. Mm -hmm. And at the end, the average fan doesn't care about it, even if it's, it's uh, sustainable or not. And we want to teach all the per these merchandisers and um, fans who buy as merchandising that it's important and obligated. And possible. Mm. And possible, of course. So let's um, spend one short moment on um, regulation. Because, again, like sometimes, of course, it's the easy authoritarian way to think, oh, if there was only a law to change that, like if only all conferences had to get lanyards made of recycled materials, how much better would that already be? Or, for instance, in your case, if there was some kind of tax um, incentive to choose the sustainability, um, the sustainable variation over the commercial one. Sure. Um, how do we need to also join these dots to push for more regulation? Or do you think this is something that needs to come gradually from the industry itself? Absolutely <laughs> not. Um, 
There's an initiative by the German government, which we've been uh, involved in since for years. It's called the Partnership of Sustainable Textiles. Textilbündnis, they also have a booth here, so do we. Um, and we've seen, or at least that from my experience working in the um, working groups, uh, you need regulation, but it's you need to discuss with the companies, which is why I would also suggest for every um, NGO um, organization to be always trying and reaching, working with companies. Um, I do think there's a certain, um, yeah, charm maybe in blaming and naming um, polluters, which has been has been sort of the strategy for a lot of um, NGOs since many years. Um, you will see also that organizations such as Greenpeace, um, yeah, valued uh, certain standards or reviewed them. Um, and as a standard uh, organization, that is really important to have the validity. But again, coming to communication, um, <laughs> which is my main topic today, um, I think it's important to do it with them. So whenever you have an idea, try to met to network as soon as possible um, and to collaborate. Yes, there's a question. Great. So, okay, this is how this is going to go down. You, um, person with white t-shirt, could you assist for a moment? On the chair in front of you, there's a cube. Can you throw that cube to this lady over here so she can ask her question? Can I really throw, yeah? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's safe. Sure. If it falls to the ground, it's fine. Yes, you did. <laughs> Let's have a round of applause. You're the first person who caught the microphone um. today. <laughs> and you're the first person who threw it. Thank you for your help. Off you go. I think that works. Okay, perfect. It's, um, I think it's about the topic communication. I am actually supporting St. Pauli. I'm on a regular basis in the stadium. But I didn't know before that panel and before this uh, event that you're changing now the way you're producing your style. And I think that's a bit of shame because, for example, my boyfriend's wearing mostly this T-shirt you're wearing. <laughs> and um, if I would know that they are producing sustainable clothes now, or you start with the main like T-shirt and hoodie, um, then I would support that more. But I couldn't find any link at your website. It was really, really hard to find the information about your decision. Yeah. Um it's because uh, we haven't finished it. So um, we started it step by step with each color. I think the black one was the first. And we haven't finished it. In the next few months, we want to, to change also the gray shirt. And then we want to start a communication. Um, at that point, we, we wasn't sure that it's so good to, to present one sustainable black shirt. And you know, on the other side of the shop, there's the non-sustainable brown shirt. And that's why we haven't um, communicated all these uh, topics already. But we want to do it. We want to motivate other clubs. And um, we only can do it with communication. And of course, um, in, the, in the future, we will have a marketing campaign or something like that for this new sustainable product. And yeah. sorry, another comment maybe. Um, talking very closely to brands, um, they some st sometimes struggle with the decision in how far their information needs to go because um, they're experiencing that their consumers may be interested, maybe not so much, but in order to create valuable um, content for the for the consumer, for him to be actually understanding things such a, as a production of a video that we just seen, it costs a lot of money. So what I tend to see sometimes it improved um, drastically, I would say in the last years. But what I tend to see is that companies are like, okay, we're focusing rather on um, our quality standard, making our products clean. Um, and um, some of them will be uh, scared of, of greenwashing as well, which we all need to be aware of. Um, there's a, yeah, the, the involvement how this industry um, is currently is there's different branches between people who are um, more informed, who have a critical view, um, who have less critical view, and there will be always consumers who don't care, it's a, as, as you say. Um, and I think we have to be, to be acceptant of the fact. But um, yeah, I think that's a super, um, super example. So I would encourage you to always, all of you, to always mail those brands because then they know that you're, as a consumer, you're actually interested. Mm. Yeah, it's a little consumer activism. Mm. You were nodding along. How do we help brands perhaps be more bold and more representative to inspire others to follow suit? Well, 
Well, I think that question comes with a layer of answers, actually. <laughs> um, one of the most important things is surely to get the stigma of sustainability out of this like dusty, unsexy corner. Because then, like, if we don't talk about merchandising only, but also about fashion, it's still a stigma in a way. So some brands, they will produce, like kind of what you said in the beginning, they will produce or they will purchase organic materials but not promote it because they are like, oh, like maybe that gives the wrong idea about the brand. Maybe that makes the price too expensive for the end consumer. So I think it really, again, goes with communication, with education and with getting sustainability on a more um, fashionable, interesting and even more away, uh, aware radar. Excellent. I'm going to look out for another hand also raising in the audience because we're closely nearing the end of the panel. Okay, if there's no hands going up, let's do a short round on how we can support ourselves. So you're already working together and, um, and, and there's been a little bit of advice exchanged on the panel already, but I, let's do maybe a quick flashlight. Um, if we want to scale all of our activities and do that next step and getting things out into the mainstream and making sure we don't no longer just preach to the converted, what are the ways that we can support each other in to get there? Should we do a quick flashlight? Do you want to start? You want to start? Sorry? Do you want to start or should I? No, oh, should you start? Um, I'm not sure <laughs> because um, I think um, an exchange um, on this topic is really important. Um, we as a merchandiser, um, we are near to other clubs and I think the exchange uh, of knowledge between um, FC St. Pauli and other clubs uh, about GOTS or recycled fibers, how they are produced or how they are used, it would help for this topic, of course. Um, Right now, I don't think that we are on this point that we are already so big and have so much power in, uh, in our project that we can, can go on to other clubs. But I think um, getting in touch with other clubs uh, for, for um, changing the knowledge would help already. Yeah. Well, for me, I, I must say uh, thanks because I got inspired and I realized now more than ever that we shouldn't produce anything anymore that is not sustainable. Um, I think it's a given that everything you should we do from now on should not add extra w waste or extra bad things to uh, to the environment. So that has helped already. Um, and for us, you know, uh, what what I was saying, I hope to partner up with the bigger players. Um, so that's it. Yeah, I also think basically education and knowledge sharing, you know, like this whole discussion about sustainability opened supply chain so so much up. They made them so transparent that now even you can go on some web shops and you see where the brand, where the uh, company produced, you know, which was unthinkable like five years or ten years ago that you will like publicly um, publish your source or your sourcer. So, um, yeah, supporting each other, sharing your knowledge. If you, if you do a great thing with your brand, share how you did it. It can only empower the whole industry and I think that's what we need right now. Yeah, and apparently that concludes my point, communication. And um, <laughs> I also see this as, um, yeah, a, as a step that we have to improve. We're a non-profit organization. Um, actually, today, after many years of not being on social media, we launched our social media account. So uh, we hope to really, um, yeah, uh, communicate what, what God stands for in a more, more broad, broader term. Continuing advocacy and lobby work um, for me personally um, shows the biggest impact uh, on the scale that I can do or that we can do as an organization and um, answer questions because sometimes, um, yeah, that's the, that's the way to, to do it. And also, I know we all talk about communication, et cetera, et cetera, and sharing. This takes a long time. So um, whenever you address someone, um, just a word of advice, address them with your questions prepared. Come prepared to business meetings. I'm um, yeah, experiencing that quite often, um, that there's a discrepancy between um, what would be important, valuing the time of your potential partner. So um, be professional, because in the sustainable textile industry, we have to be even more professional than the conventional ones um, in order to spread our impact. So. 
Thank you so much for being here today and answering my questions. I very much enjoyed the time with you on stage and would like to invite everybody to give you a big round of applause. Thank you Thank all you. for your great work and for being here today.